Hello, everyone. In this lecture podcast, I talk about statehood and recognition. This is Manjo Oison, your unit coordinator for Laws 12070, Public International and Human Rights Law. There's a lot of interest on the topic on statehood and recognition, uh, especially because if you were to examine what's happening in the international stage, and also in the United Nations, there's been a lot of talk about uh, Palestine seeking admission to the United Nations. And uh, eventually, a few months back, the United Nations General Assembly issued a resolution accepting the uh, Palestine, the state of Palestine, as a, as a, uh, as a state. And however, the problem is that uh, the United States, Israel, and a few other countries, as well as uh, several states, well, the United States and Israel, uh, opposed the uh, acceptance or the recognition of Palestine as a state, and about 16 other states or members of the United Nations abstained from the vote to declare the state of Palestine as a state. So there is a, a strong interest uh, as to the question of whether you know, a state might be a state or not. And you would have also noticed that a few months back in Spain, for example, the uh, Catalan government, uh, had a referendum, and uh, the question, the political question for them was whether or not they should declare an independent state for the state of Catalan. And uh, for those who might not be very familiar with the with the with the province, I mean, it's a province of, of Spain at the moment. For those who might not be familiar with the province of Catalan, its capital is actually uh, Barcelona, which would be very familiar to a lot of us. And so um, they had a government, they had a referendum, and then they sought to, uh, you know, they, they had a question of whether or not they should declare themselves as a state. However, the federal government, uh, the, federal, uh, common, uh, the federal Spanish government, decided to arrest the, the leaders of the Catalan government, and uh, some of them had to flee to the European Union because they were going to be arrested in Spain. And so in that case, had the, the Catalan government decided to proceed with this intention to declare itself as a state, what, what would have happened in international law? Would it have become a state? And, you know, what, what's so important about a state gaining recognition as a state, or at least having a de jure existence as a state? Why is that important anyway? And uh, you will also recall that even today, uh, in um, Canada, there has been a, an attempt at the part of uh, the province of Quebec. And uh, Montreal, like if I'm not mistaken, is the capital of Quebec. There have been, uh, you know, repeated referendums to try to secede, uh, for, for Quebec as a province to secede from, from the state of, of Canada and to declare itself as an independent state. And what exactly would be the requirements for, if it were to happen, what exactly would be the requirements for, for, um, for Quebec to become a state of its own? Would there be a need for recognition by other states? And we will see, and you know, you're very, you would be very familiar with uh, the state of Taiwan. Taiwan, which a lot of us would allude to as a country, uh, has been in existence as a state for a long time. However, it is not even a part of the United Nations. And, you know, Taiwan engages in international relations with several states, including Australia. It is a very uh, important uh, state because of its capacity to produce a lot of very important technological goods and services. And yet it is not uh, recognized by China as a state. And uh, China looks at Taiwan merely as a as uh, one of its uh, provinces. So why is it important? And so today, uh, when in this lecture podcast, we look at statehood and recognition. And we will realize that among others, that the, one of the main reasons why you would want, if you were, you know, why a state would want to be considered a state de jure would be because it would then have certain rights and uh, powers under international law. Um, one of the rights, for example, of a state would be uh, for it to be free from interference and intervention by other, by other states. So if there were to be another state which would seek to enter the territory of what would be a de jure state, that would be a breach of international law. 
And of course, a state, if it is a state, also would have the power to engage in international relations, probably even enter into, um, if it wish, to enter into international loans about international agreements. So um, we're going to examine, you know, the rights, powers, and duties of states uh, in this lecture podcast. So after uh, going through this podcast, after studying this topic, you should be able to discuss and explain the rights, duties, and powers of a state by virtue of its legal personality as a state. We shall also examine the criteria of statehood and the effect of recognition by other states on the de jure existence of a state. So when you say de jure, it means that by law, it's not, you know, it's not just a question of fact, but by law, that a state exists. And so we're going to be examining that. Examining that. So the advantage of um, a state being considered a state in international law is that it would then enjoy certain rights, duties, and powers established in international law. And it would, of course, have the capacity to act internationally. And um, that is a crucial point because, as we know, the main source of international law is actually states. They're, and they, the states are also the main subjects of international law because states uh, create international law, for example, uh, by entering into treaties or conventions, and also because of customary international law when uh, consistent state practice, which has been considered to be legally binding by states, that also creates international law. And that is through the actions of states. So uh, it is crucial. It is therefore very important for, for a state uh, to actually uh, have a legal personality as a state because it will enjoy rights, duties, and powers established in international law and then cap the capacity to act, act internationally. And we will examine this in greater detail in this lecture podcast. So among the other powers of states would be, one, it would have the, the power to create international law for treaties and international law. As I mentioned earlier, it also has the power to enter into international contracts, whether as you know, whether those contracts are in performance of sovereign public acts or what are known as acts yuri in theory or as private commercial acts or yuri just choice. It will also have the power to sign and ratify treaties. It would also have the right to, the power to sue or be sued before international courts and tribunals. It would also have the power to sue or be sued before foreign domestic courts for the private commercial acts and it can also bring an international claim for injuries to some of its subjects. So a state, the moment it exists in international law, would have certain powers. And um, including, for example, uh, because uh, as you notice later on, one of the rights of a state would be freedom from intervention and freedom from interference from other states. It would also have the power, for example, to create its own army and it would also mean that um, any state that seeks to enter the territory of, a, of, a, of another state would be in breach of international law. So uh, it, it is therefore important for, for a state uh, to be considered a state international law. And uh, as a crucial point, as I said, at the start of the, when the United Nations was uh, founded right after World War II, there were only 51 states then, but today there are 193 uh, member states. And so therefore, you know, there, there, there is a desire uh, for independence on the part of um, certain governments to have themselves become states, uh, which means because, you know, if you are a state, then you have the right to self-determination. You can determine what your life to happen within your state instead of having to be subject to the control of another government. So, for example, if, if, you, if you look at Queensland, there are constraints to what King's Queensland can do simply because you have the Commonwealth Government of Australia that exercises certain powers. And Queensland, for example, does not have, uh, because it is not, Queensland is not a subject of international law. It cannot enter into international relations uh, as a state. And uh, so there are, there are limitations. Um, and so this is the reason why there is always a, a desire on the part of states to, to become states. And uh, as we see later on, this includes the, the, the right to uh, immunity from arrest of uh, diplomatic personnel and so on. So let's look at the rights of states this time. So one of the 
the most important rights of states is actually the right to territorial sovereignty, which enables states to have full competence over all activities, persons, and property within its territory. And this has been recognized in the case in the ICJ uh, pertaining to jurisdictional immunities of the state, which was the case of Germany versus Italy and uh, with Greece intervening. This is a crucial point because if one is a state, then another state would have no power to enter into the territory of another state because that would be a breach of international law. For another state to enter into the territory of another state uh, would, would actually be considered uh, an invasion, and as later on as we see, it would have the state whose territory has been invaded by another state would have the right to resort to the use of force in order to repel an invasion in this territory. And when we speak of a territory, for example, we're not just talking of the land, we're talking of uh, waters, and we're talking of the airspace above um, that particular land, excluding outer space, of course. And so therefore, a state, if one is a state, it has a right to territorial sovereignty, and it also means that it has the, the power and the, and the right to determine you know, uh, the type of government it may wish, it can create laws for itself, and it has uh, full uh, and supreme authority over the people within its territory. So that's a right of a state. It, can no longer, it cannot be the subject of uh, another state because of the right to territorial sovereignty. Another right of a state would be that it would be immune from the, ju the jurisdiction of another state. Based on the principle of state or sovereign immunity, which is recognized as a general rule of customary international law, which is solid or solidly rooted in the current practice of state. So what it means is that assuming that uh, a state undertakes certain acts, and these acts are uh, done in a sovereign or governmental capacity. So let's say that, you know, um, uh, the, the, there might be a state and, you know, and it, it causes uh, a lot of, it causes pollution and because of forest fires, let's say Indonesia. There, there, uh, Indonesia, for example, uh, every year there seems to be a lot of forest fires in Indonesia because of um, uh, the burning of trees by, maybe by illegal uh, traders there. And what it ends up doing is to pollute, uh, cause air pollution, and it affects the people in Malaysia as well as in Singapore. But the question is, um, can, you know, can, can Singapore or Malaysia uh, sue the government of uh, Indonesia in the courts of Singapore, in the courts of, of Malaysia, uh, for, for harm to its environment or even harm to its people? And the answer is no, because in that case, um, the, the Indonesian state would be imbued from the jurisdiction of another state. It would also mean uh, it's not just civil jurisdiction, but also criminal jurisdiction. Even assuming that um, the, you know, there are um, certain activities that may be considered to be criminal, whether it's perpetrated by government officials or perpetrated by, or perpetrated by uh, civilians in their individual capacity, <clears throat> for as long as the acts were done within the territory of that particular of one state, those acts cannot be the subject of of jurisdiction by another state because of uh, the, the right of immunity from the jurisdiction of another state. What it also means, a third right of a state would be that it would have a right to independence and freedom from non-intervention by other states. So the moment a state is declared de jure or by law to be a state, it would actually mean that under international law, it would have uh, the protection of international law because other states cannot enter the, the territory of the state because to do so would be a breach of uh, the right to territorial sovereignty and a breach therefore, of customary international law. And it also means that other states, uh, it would be illegal uh, and contrary to international law for other states to intervene uh, in another state. And when we say intervention, it doesn't even have to be military intervention. It could even be political intervention. It could even be economic intervention. And so therefore, you know, when you, when you uh, recall what had happened during the uh, last presidential elections in the United States, there had been claims that Russia was trying to intervene uh, in the uh, elections and political processes of the United States. If it could have been proven that uh, the Russian government was responsible for uh, 
for this uh, intervention, there could potentially be a claim for, um, for a violation of international law uh, by, the, by, the by the Russian government uh, in, the, in the affairs of, uh, of another state. So that is the advantage of, uh, that, that is again a right of a state. And of course, there is the, the right to diplomatic immunity and protection of the officials of a state from interference, such as by arrest and prosecution by other states abroad. So there is diplomatic immunity. So a state would then have the power to appoint uh, officials to represent itself abroad. And those uh, officials which would represent itself, which would represent it abroad, would be free from arrest and prosecution, even if those particular officials, for as long as they have diplomatic immunity, even if they commit you know, heinous crimes, they will be free from arrest uh, as, as a matter of international law. Now, states, however, also have duties and obligations. One of them is that they have to comply with their treaty obligations. So the moment that a state has uh, entered into a treaty, it has a duty under international law to comply with its treaty obligations. And I think we discussed this under the principle of pacta sunt servanda. Every single international obligation must be complied with in good faith. And a state, therefore, that fails to comply with these treaty obligations would be in breach of international law. A state would also have an obligation to obey customary international law, such as the duty to respect the territorial sovereignty of another state, or observe state and diplomatic immunity, and especially peremptory or use cogent norms, such as the prohibition against genocide, slave trade, maritime, piracy, torture, and wars of aggression. Now, um, you, you might have uh, the situation of maybe Al Qaeda or even ISIS, and they might have a government, presumably. They probably have a territory. We're going to be examining the, the, the crucial elements of what would constitute a state. Uh, so they would have a population, they would have a territory, they would have government. And at the moment, we will not talk yet about the power to, to enter interna international relations. But the question then is, you know, ISIS and uh, Al-Qaeda, given that they have a territory, should they control, they have a government, and they have a population that they, they control and are loyal to them or be subject to them. The question is, are they states? And would they uh, be bound by the rules of customary international law? And the answer is no, because they are not states. So ISIS as a government or whatever territory they control are not considered, you know, those uh, are not considered states, even if they declare themselves, I don't know how they call them themselves, but even if they declare themselves to be states, they aren't states at the moment. And so therefore they actually do not have an obligation to obey customary international law. Uh, what, what this also means is that because they, they are not states, they are not subjects of international law, uh, they can't be brought before the International Court of Justice, for example, uh, for violating norms of international law. However, it also means that because they are not states, they do not have the, the powers and rights of states. So um, they don't have the, the right to independence, they don't have the right to freedom uh, from intervention or interference from other states, and they don't have the freedom that the right to territorial integrity and territorial sovereignty. Which means, therefore, that, that because they are not states, I'm talking about Qaeda and ISIS, um, it would mean that uh, it is permissible for any state, uh, for a state, actually, to enter into a territory which they control. And of course, the one that would do that would be the, would be the, would the, would be the state that actually uh, uh, has uh, jurisdiction over the, that particular territory controlled by maybe Al-Qaeda or, or ISIS. So the, the bigger question for us then is, when is a state a state? So we recall that when the United Nations was founded after World War II, there were only 51 states, but since then, there have now been 193 UN members. Um, so there were some uh, states which no longer exist, such as um, Yugoslavia or uh, the former Soviet Union, they no longer exist, they've ceased to exist. And in their place, there have been uh, new states. So for example, when the former Soviet Union, which was then known as the Union, Union of, Social, uh, of Soviet Socialist Republics, when, uh, when the USSR 
uh, broke up in the 1990s as a result of uh, Gorbachev's Glasnost and Perestroika, there emerged a lot of uh, breakaway republics such as Armenia, Azerbaijan, Belarus, Estonia, Georgia, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Latvia, Lithuania, Moldova, Russia, Tajikistan, Turkmenistan, Ukraine, and Uzbekistan. And the bigger question we ask then is, you know, how did these breakaway republics become states of their own? What, what would be, you know, necessary uh, for them to have become states? Uh, we will also recall that the former Socialist Federal Republic of Yugoslavia uh, broke up as well in the 1990s. And as a result, we have heard of the Kosovo Wars, including the genocide that happened in that area. And from the former Socialist Federal Republic of Yugoslavia, you now have the Federal Republic of Yugoslavia, Croatia, Slovenia, Macedonia, Serbia, Montenegro, and Kosovo. Now, Kosovo, of course, is different because it is recognized by most uh, European Union members, but it is not recognized by Russia and Serbia as a state. Um, and so Kosovo at the moment, for example, uh, if I'm not mistaken, is actually still under the protection of the, the United Nations uh, Protection Force because of the possibility of uh, Serb Serbian aggression into its territory. You also have the case of Palestine, Palestine, uh, which uh, has been recognized as a state by a majority of the members of the United Nations, but the United States, as well as Israel, refused to recognize Palestine as a state. And um, you had about 16 states which, states which abstained from the vote uh, a few months back. And so that again leads to the question, in that particular case, is Palestine a state if it is not yet a member of the United Nations, although a majority of the world community recognizes it as a state, but the United States and Israel do not recognize it as a state. And so what happens, therefore, if it is, we recall that if a state is a state, it will be entitled to certain powers, rights, and duties. And uh, one of the rights of a state would be the right to territorial integrity. If the United States and Israel, for example, do not recognize Palestine as a state, would it mean that Palestine does not have a right to, to territorial integrity and territorial sovereignty? And would it mean, therefore, that Israel, for example, will not be in breach of international law if it seeks to enter into the territory controlled by Palestine? Because as far as uh, Israel is concerned, Palestine is not a state. That particular question can also be extended in the case of Taiwan, because although Taiwan uh, originally was a member of the United Nations. Uh, it was eased out and ejected in the United Nations as a result of, the, of China, the People's Republic of China uh, in the late 1940s. And in its place, it was China, which, so you can see the politicking going on in the world community, it was China that became the, the state recognized by the United Nations. The question is, is Taiwan a state? Uh, given the fact that it, it is not even a member of the United Nations and China continues to recognize Taiwan merely as its own province. And so therefore, as far as China is concerned, if Taiwan is not a state, would it mean that China does, that, that Taiwan does not have a right to territorial sovereignty and integrity, which means that China at any time that it likes can just you know, enter into uh, the territory of Taiwan. But we do know that Taiwan has a military of its own. What would happen then? And so these are some of the, uh, the questions that we should be asking ourselves about when we think of the topic about statehood and recognition. So uh, the, the criteria for, for statehood can be found in Article 1, Paragraph 4 of the 1933 Montevideo Convention on the Rights and Duties of States which provides that the state as a person of international law should possess four qualifications. One, it must have a permanent population. Two, it must have a defined territory. Three, it must have a government. And four, it must have a capacity to enter into relations with other states. And so therefore, uh, what we need to remember is that the 1933 Montevideo Convention of the Rights and Duties of States is considered to be a codification of customary international law. Which means actually that, because this was, um, this, this was uh, signed in 1933, there would, be, there would have been a lot of states which did not end up becoming parties uh, to the 1933 Montevideo Convention. The question therefore arises whether or not states which were not parties to the 1933 Montevideo Convention 
are bound by the treaty? And the answer is no, they're not bound by the treaty, they're not parties, but because it is con because the 1933 Montevideo Convention is considered to be a codification of customary international law, it means therefore that the contents of that treaty are considered to be part of international law as customary international law. And so therefore you have four elements uh, of what would be considered a state uh, in international law. And we're going to be examining these elements in a short while. So what you have is that, you know, when you, one of the crucial elements of a, of a state, of course, is a, a population. And the question is, is there a requirement of a minimum number of people to be part of a state? Now, you will notice that, that the Vatican ha uh, is actually considered a state in international law and has a representation in the United Nations, but it only has a population of 451. Tuvalu is also a state. It only has 9,893 9, inhabitants. You have, you have states like Palau, San Marino, Liechtenstein, Monaco, Marshall Islands, American Samoa, Cayman Islands, Bermuda, Andorra, and so on, which have uh, populations of less than 80,000. So Brisbane is obviously uh, bigger in terms of population than, than these states. And so therefore, with a population, you know, would, would there be a minimum number? And the answer is no. For as long as there is a popu permanent population, such as the Vatican, uh, you can have a state. And even in the case of the Vatican, uh, perhaps the only people who actually live there are actually the priests and the Pope, because everyone else who, you know, who live around the Vatican in Rome are actually citizens of Italy, and yet the Vatican is a state. Now, if you compare that with the populations of uh, of China, which has 1.4 billion people, India has 1.2 billion, the United States has 321 million, Indonesia 255 million, and Australia has 23 million people. So what it also suggests to us that some states are really small in terms of population, and yet they are considered states. And um, as far as the United Nations goes, at least as far as the General Assembly is concerned, each state carries only one, one vote. So they have one, you know, you know, they, they have the same voting rights, whether it's Palau or Tuvalu or Vatican State exercising its right to vote in the UN. Its vote carries the same weight as China and India and the United, and the United States and even Indonesia and Australia, despite the, you know, the huge and bigger population of these, of these other states, as far as the General Assembly is concerned. And of course, we know that the, uh, the power really resides in, uh, in the United Nations Security Council, and that's where China and Russia and the United States would be crucial because they, have, they are permanent sitting uh, members of the, the United Nations Security Council, and they, they have the right to a veto. And we're going to be examining that later on in the unit. In addition, a crucial point about uh, becoming a state is that state must have a defined territory. And when you speak of defined territory, the territory does not just comprise the land, but also the sea and the airspace that the state possesses and controls. So the moment a state uh, exists, the Ure, and we talk of territorial sovereignty and territorial integrity, that state would have territorial sovereignty and integrity not only over the land, but also the, you know, the seas and the airspace above it. So, it is therefore important to ascertain and define with some reasonableness what a state's territory is. Um, and in the case of Federal Republic of Germany versus Denmark, the North Sea Continental Shelf Cases, the ICJ said, that there is no instance, that there is, for instance, no rule that the land frontiers of a state must be fully delimited and defined, and often in various places, and for a long period, they are not. These are a crucial point because you can have states where you know um, they're contiguous to each other. It could even be the United States and Mexico. They're contiguous to each other. And how do you actually demarcate those areas uh, where you know that part belongs to the United States, that part belongs to Mexico? Or if you talk about the border again of Canada and the United States, where lies the border? And and uh, th there is no requirement that there has to be mathematical precision, especially because that can be difficult to do. Um, you know, the, the lands can shift. What is only crucial is that there has to be some reasonable way for us to determine what 
uh, a state's territory is. And uh, in the Sahara, in the Sahara Desert, for example, you, you have a lot of states there where all you have would be the Sahara Desert. And how do you know actually where, you know, where exactly are the boundaries of each state territory? And can that lead to a possible uh, confrontation between states? Because, you know, if they were to set, of course, you'd wonder why would they bother putting in a military force there? But, you know, if they did, that would be problematic because, you know, when, when sand shift, especially because of storms or, or um, how do you call them, sand storms, you wouldn't know where the boundaries are. Okay, but the rule is, you know, um, the rule is it is enough that there is a way to uh, reasonably determine what the territory is. Okay, now, the, the other relevant question for us is, can a new state be created on the basis of an artificial island? as the defined territory. So for example, um, what if there is a group of people and they decide that, you know, they, they've seen that there is a, uh, there seem to be in some sunk aircraft carriers somewhere in the Pacific, and they decide to uh, build a, uh, you know, a state out of that. Uh, and, or it could be that somebody tries to put portable platforms, whatever that might be, and you know, create a state out of it. And for those of you who were part, probably part of my generation, if you were watching Water World, there was a movie headed by uh, Kevin Costner, where those were probably ships, right? And they tried, you know, the question was, it was not gonna be a state if you have ships and you try to create a territory, I mean, you try to create a state out of a group of ships that have sunk you know, somewhere in the, in the middle of the sea. Because in that case, you could have a population, you might even have a government. You can say that, you know, uh, that for the moment, let's not talk about the, the capacity to enter international relations, but you can say that there seems to be a territory. But the answer is no, because uh, in the case of Reed Duchy of Sealand, uh, a case is added by the General Federal Administrative Court, and this is considered to be part of the general principles of international law. An anti-aircraft platform, which was then considered to be an artificial island, which was erected eight miles outside the territorial waters of the UK, and which was secured to the seabed by concrete pillars, did not satisfy the criterion of, of a territory. Now, government, the, it, it, for you to have a state, of course, you need a government. Because how else can you know the population be governed? Who will take care of the population? So you need a government. Now, the, the thing with the government is that you need a sovereign government or one which has supreme independent authority and control over the territory that it claims. So therefore, going back to the question about Spain, you know, the Catalan government, um, they had a referendum, and I think there was even an attempt to declare itself as the, the Catalan as, a, as an independent republic or an independent state independent from Spain. The problem, however, is that it was, what well, should I say, easy. But the Spanish federal government succeeded in ejecting the, uh, the government of uh, Catalan. And uh, the government officials had to flee uh, Catalan and uh, go to the, to the United Nations, uh, to, the, to the European Union, in order not to be arrested by the Spanish government. So in that case, therefore, even if it were to be said that the Catalan government, you know, would have attempted to assert itself as a state, it would have been very problematic in international law because you don't really have a sovereign government in Catalan or a government that is controlled by the state of Catalan because what you now have in Catalan is actually a, a government that is controlled by the Spanish federal government. So it is that's problematic. If you want to be a if you want to be a state, you need to have. Uh, a government that is supreme and independent. And it also means that you must oftentimes be capable of protecting yourself, at least for the moment, until somebody else protects you, like Taiwan, which is being protected, of course, by the United, by the United States, where the, with the um, is it the Seventh uh, Naval Command in the, in the South China Sea and the Pacific Ocean. So you need, you need to have that sovereign government for, for a state to exist. The URE. Now, there is, however, a requirement that it has to be a particular form of government. So you can have a government that doesn't observe the rule of law. You can have a government that is communist. You can have a government that is a dictatorship. It doesn't matter because, um, as the 
international court of justice rule in the Western Sahara case, there is no rule of international law in the view of the court that requires the structure of a state to follow any particular pattern, as is evident uh, from the diversity of forms of states found in the world today. So you can have, you know, uh, dictatorships, you can have military juntas, such as in Myanmar, in Burma, and even in Thailand. Uh, these are military dictatorships. You can have monarchies where there are uh, no human rights, uh, which would be recognized, such as maybe Saudi Arabia. But they would be states because there is no requirement that a state has to be of any particular form. At the same time, it is even possible that the moment a state has existed, that its government may flee. And you will recall that's what happened in the case of uh, Kuwait when Iraq, in the 1990s attacked Kuwait and the, the, uh, the Kuwait monarchy had to flee for a while. Uh, that did not mean that the, you know, Kuwait ceased to exist as a state. It wasn't. It was a state. And Iraq actually was in breach of international law by invading, uh, by invading uh, Kuwait at that time. A fourth important point about uh, a state being a state is that it must have a capacity for international relations. So the Permanent Court of International Justice said in the case of SS Wimbledon that the right of entering into international engagement is an attribute of state sovereignty. Now this is very related to the issue about recognition because it's kind of a chicken and egg thing. Um, when does one become a state? Is it Does one become a state because it has the capacity to in, enter into international relations? But how do you know that it has entered into international relations with another state? Is it, because, it would have to mean that the, another state would have had to recognize it uh, uh, as, as another state. And so um, is it by the fact that you know, a state is considered the euro or by law to be a state that it is a state, uh, regardless of whether or not it has entered into international relations, or is it the fact that that state is actually able to demonstrate an ability to enter international relations that determines uh, whether or not it is in fact a state. And what is, what is uh, crucial here is that we're talking here about capacity. We're talking here of a right. So for as long as um, you know, there is a capacity to enter in international relations, and it doesn't have to be international relations with all states across the world for as long as there is a capacity, because you have a you have a functioning sovereign government that is able and willing uh, to enter into international relations with other states. Then you can have a state. It also uh, importantly means that that uh, state must have sovereignty, because it means that it must have independence uh, from another state. So for as long as uh, you, you have a you know, so-called state that is not independent because it is subject to the control by another state, then you cannot have, you know, that cannot be a state because it, it's not independent and it wouldn't then have the power to uh, enter into international relations with other states. Now, how do we determine the difference? How do we look, in, how do we look into the difference between state existence versus recognition? We will notice that uh, if you look at the Montevideo Convention on 1933 Montevideo Convention of the Rights and Judicial States, there is no requirement that for a state to be a state that there has to be international recognition. So recognition is different from existence. The moment a state possesses the four qualifications which have been identified in Article 1, 1 of the Montevideo Convention, then you have a state in international law, regardless of, of recognition. So uh, the moment a state, for example, has a permanent population, it has a defined territory, it has a government that is sovereign and supreme, and it has the capacity to enter into relations with other states, then a state would exist the URI or by law. Recognition is not necessary. In fact, the 1933 Montevideo Con uh, Convention under Article 3, uh, provides that the political existence of the state is independent of the recognition by the other states. So even before recognition, the state has the right to defend its integrity and independence 
to provide for its conservation and prosperity, and consequently to organize itself as it sees fit, to legislate upon its interests, administer its services, and to define the jurisdiction and competence of its courts. So uh, what, what this would mean is that the existence of a state, as we said, does not really uh, does not rely or depend on recognition by other states. It is the moment that uh, a state has the, the four qualifications as uh, indicated or provided in the 1933 Montevideo Convention, then a state would have emerged in international law. And from that moment, upon the de jure existence of a state, that state would then be entitled to certain rights and powers under international law. But that begs the question, what then is the purpose of, uh, of recognition? As you said, it's a political act. But not only is recognition a political act, it also means that if a state is a state, then other states would have a, a duty to, um, to observe certain norms of international law, at least based on customary international law. So for example, um, in the case of Palestine, what is the significance of the United States and Israel not recognizing Palestine as a state? Would it mean, therefore, that the, state, that the United States and Israel would have no obligation uh, to, you know, to recognize the right of, of Palestine to territorial integrity and sovereignty, or the right against non-interference or non-intervention? And so if Israel or the United States, if they wanted to, if they were to enter into the territory of Palestine, would that be a breach of international law? But again, the other question is, if we again recall, as far as international law is concerned, by convention it's understood that international law is created by the consent of states. This is the positivist uh, rule of international law. So international law is created by the consent of states. So if the United States, for example, and Israel do not recognize Palestine as a state, would the United States and Israel have an obligation to confer, or at least recognize certain rights in the case of state of the state of Palestine, even if they did not consent to uh, the existence of uh, Palestine as being a state. So we're going to examine that because at least there are two schools of thought on uh, what determines, who determines that a state exists. So one is the declaratory theory, and the second is the constitutive theory. Under the declaratory theory, a state becomes a state upon meeting the Montevideo Convention criteria, which you said, it involves uh, a state, would be a state de jure, the moment you have a permanent population, the moment you have a defined territory, you have a government that is supreme and sovereign, and then you have the capacity of that government to enter into relations with other states. At that very moment, you have a, you have a state. It exists de jure, so that the recognition by another state is merely a political act, and it does not add any further legal effect to the de jure char character of a state. And so whether or not, you know, you have the, a majority of the world community recognizing a state as a state, or you only have two or three or other states recognizing another as a state, that doesn't really matter for as long as a, a, a new state uh, would, would have the qualifications under the 1933 Montevideo Convention, which, as we said, is a codification of customary international law. So that the Declaration of Recognition merely declaim, declares and confirms the existence of a state upon its fulfillment of the Montevideo Convention, and it is not recognition that confers statehood upon a state. Okay, so that should be clear. But then again, you know, that, that leads us to the question, because a state, the moment a state is considered the unit of a state, then it has certain rights, including the right to uh, territorial integrity and territorial sovereignty. It will mean, therefore, that other states would be bound, duty bound under international law to recognize the rights of a state. But what if, if recognition does not add any legal effect to the, to the existence of a state? Would it then mean that, you know, another state that refuses to recognize another state as being a state, would it have the, the duty to observe international law? or the rights of, of that particular state if it doesn't recognize it as a state. And this brings us to the constitutive theory. The problem with the declaratory theory in a sense is that it impairs the positive basis of international law, which, as we said, is founded on state con consent. So there are those who view, who assert, that it is not enough that you know, a state uh, has the four qualifications under the 1933 Montevideo Convention on the Rights and Duties of States. 
there is also what is known an alternative theory known as the constitutive theory, which posits that the theory of existence of a state, which means that it will then have certain rights and obligations, would rest on the recognition by other states. So even if a state may fulfill and have all the criteria under the Montevideo Convention, there is a view that there has to be a constitutive theory. There have, other states must first recognize a state to be a state for that to be a state. Now, the problem, however, with the, with the constitutive theory is that if you follow that you know, line of thinking, how many states must there be uh, that must give recognition before a state is said to exist under international law? That's problem number one. Um, do you need much majority of the world community to recognize a state to be a new state? Or is it enough that you have maybe two or three? Uh, two, and remember, even the state of Israel was only founded uh, in recent years. Uh, what, I think, if I'm not mistaken, immediately after World War II. So even the state of Israel is a new state. Uh, I mean, in comparison to other, you know, to other states. Um, so Israel, uh, if I'm not mistaken, was taken out of the what then was the state of Palestine. And so, is that correct? So that's, uh, you know, the state of Israel came from the territory of, of, of other states. And two, the other problem with the constitutive theory is that um, would a new state have rights and privileges in international law uh, prior to the recognition by other states? Or would the rights and duties of a new state uh, emerge only once it has been recognized by other states, assuming we know what num what magic number that might be. And three, the other problem with the constitutive theory seems to be that it would appear that the de jure existence of state would become indeterminate. You wouldn't know if it exists or not if it has to be based on recognition. And then again, you have, you're, you're, you're caught with the problem of uh, having to determine, you know, those instances when some states recognize a state and others do not. And however, to fully reject the constitute, constitutive theory would also go against international law because as we said, international law rests on state consent. So why should a state uh, who, which hasn't recognized another state to be a state be compelled to confer upon that new state certain rights and duties which it never recognized in the first place? And so perhaps on balance, the better the better uh, view would be that uh, while, while there is no doubt that under international law, the de jure existence of the state would, would arise the moment that state meets the, the criteria or the qualifications under the 1933 Montevideo Convention. So in other words, the moment a state uh, has the four uh, qualifications of a permanent population, a defined territory, a government that is supreme, that is sovereign, and it has the capacity to enter into relations with other states, at that very moment, that state actually is a state in international law. However, you can say that the, uh, the constitutive, constitutive theory has an importance in international law in the sense that there is still, uh, recognition still plays a role in international law. If we said that uh, international law is largely based on state consent, what it tells us is that a state that refuses to uh, consider or, or recognize another state as a state would not be bound really under international law to confer upon it certain uh, rights and obligations. Now, of course, ultimately, whether or not uh, the non-recognition would also mean that that other state would have the, the power or the right to you know, enter into the tori territory of another is altogether a different question because if there is military intervention or interference in, by some of the means, uh, that is altogether a different question. But uh, the better view on balance is that you know, the moment a state has the qualifications, it becomes a state, but it doesn't mean that those states that do not recognize the existence of a state are necessarily bound in interna by international law to confer, uh, you know, to observe that new state to have certain rights and duties. And as observed, for example, by the Vice President of the International Court of Justice in the case of Bosnia and Herzegovina versus Serbia and Montenegro, uh, 
there is a relativism inherent in the constitutive theory of recognition, which itself prevents the drawing of any firm inference. So there is a problem with the constitutive theory because it is kind of uh, relativist because in a sense to some, uh, it, would, it would mean that in some cases, you know, a state uh, would exist, but in other cases it would not because there is that indeterminacy as a result of, um, as a result of the need for uh, consent by other states. So with that, uh, we have discussed uh, uh, in this topic, the uh, statehood and recognition of states. And after studying this topic, you should then be able to discuss and explain the rights, duties, and powers of the state by virtue of its legal personality as a state, the criteria for statehood and the effect of recognition by other states on the de jure existence of a state. And thanks uh, for listening and watching to this video podcast. This is Manjo Oison again. Bye.